I was with the amazing Brad Wilcox this morning, and he gave me like a whistle stop tour of BYU. Oh wow! Yeah, I, I went to one of his classes. That was cool. Um, but he took me to some kind of art gallery and showed me a huge original painting in there, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's the one where Christ is in sort of a courtyard and he's holding up the a rag or a, a shelter, and there's a man underneath there, and there are crowds. Of, you know the one I'm talking. Yeah, I think Christ at the Pool of Bethesda by Karl Block. Yeah, Karl Block. That's it, and it it was bought from Denmark or something. Yeah, I, I always found it strange that there's this kind of watermelon in the bottom with a knife. I don't know. If <laughs> I mean, how now he's that next time. Yeah, well, now you're gonna ruin the painting. For yeah, me. yeah. I've always wondered that. Um, but Brad said something that you might not know is that they there's a huge cross. In, hmm in gold at the top of the frame uh, and it's very majestic glorious looking and not wanting to put too much emphasis on the cross BYU had taken that off and just put it on the frame however after your book they put that cross back on and it's there in all its glory really I did not know that story did you not no have, have you seen it though have you seen I haven't cross seen. I haven't seen, not seen the cross on top of it. I'm gonna have to go take a look at that. Yeah, you should. Brad, Brad told me I needed to specifically oh, mention. Wow. But uh, I wondered, in response to that, sort of, what were you seeing about the cross that made you concerned and want to write that book, Consider the Cross, that you did? So, if if we would have gone back um, to the year 2017, I was teaching in Jerusalem. And on one afternoon, this was at the very beginning of, of the year I spent in Jerusalem, I was walking with one of my colleagues and we were talking about Christ's atonement. And my colleague, Matt Gray said to me, John, why do you think in the church we so emphasize Gethsemane when it comes to Christ's atonement rather than the crucifixion as well? And I thought to myself, I'm like, well, of course, because the scriptures emphasize Gethsemane. And then I started to investigate and I found out that actually the scriptures emphasize Christ's crucifixion. There's two passages of scripture that talk about Christ suffering for our sins and more than 50 that talk about Christ dying for our sins. So then I started to become more interested in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I realized that it was a part of Christ's atonement that I had honestly ignored. I would talk a lot about Gethsemane as a teacher. I would talk a lot about the resurrection, but kind of skip over his crucifixion. And then I started to do more research and I learned that Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, in fact, every church president, including President Nelson, has frequently emphasized Christ's crucifixion and its atoning significance. In fact, President Nelson, he gave a talk a few years ago and he said, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he said something like, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ experienced every sin, every pain, everything you and I will ever experience And then he said, all of that suffering was intensified as the Savior was cruelly crucified on Calvary's cross. So here President Nelson is is saying, whatever you or I are thinking, oh, this happened in Gethsemane, that's Mm -hmm. intensified on the cross. So I think that was one big part of it. And then living in Jerusalem, and and you may or may not be kind of uh, experienced this in some of your current life and travels, I just saw the cross as a symbol, a lot more than I was used to seeing it Mm. in uh, America. So pretty much everywhere I went, and maybe if I had grown up in the South, it'd be different, but pretty much everywhere I went in Jerusalem, I was seeing a cross. And I started to, as I was thinking more about Christ's crucifixion, I came to realize that for 99% of the Christians in the world, the cross is the symbol of Jesus Christ. And so when I was growing up, I don't know, I kind of always looked at it as like, oh, that's not, not a good symbol. That's what other people do. And I realized, no, this is something that I can incorporate into my own life, that I can find joy and peace as I contemplate Jesus Christ and his atonement. Do you think it's like a, an instant knee-jerk reaction when you see it to be like, well, that's not the symbol of the church. Therefore, you know, we, there, there, there was, uh, was it President Hinckley who said, he was asked that question, why isn't the cross a symbol? Or, and he said something like, well, we focus more on the resurrection. And I guess, well, yeah, that answers the question of, you know, I, I serve my mission in Malaysia and there are, it's a mixing pot of cultures mm. uh, and they have to distinguish themselves. It's a country that abides by Sharia law. And so, you know, if you aren't 
Muslim or if you are Muslim, you have to identify yourself because you live by a different set of rules. You know, like if I was door knocking in Malaysia, which we didn't really do, but every door would have the symbol of the religion that that house belonged to. Oh, wow. And for us, that was like, all right, we can knock on this door. We can't knock on this door. And so, yeah, we, we always saw the cross as the symbol of, okay, we can, <laughs> we can knock on that door. Uh, was there a symbol for the, if I was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, what symbol would I have on my door? Gosh, I'm trying to remember if there was a specific example. No, I don't, I don't think there was. You always knew, though. You always knew by the art they had in their house. But you know, generally on the door, you would have the, the Sikh sign or the Hindu sign or the Islam sign um, and a cross. And that's what I was wondering. If, if I was a Latter-day Saint, would I have a cross on my front door as yeah, a sign? No. Or would I have nothing? No, which is kind of interesting uh, that we have pushed ourselves so far from Interesting. associating with that, even though we do sort of identify as Christian. Well, not sort of, we do. And one, um, thing, one, one thing that I thought, because so to go back to your question, yeah, I do think that at least for me growing up, there was a knee-jerk reaction. If, if I was, even when I was a full-time missionary, if I saw someone wearing a cross necklace, for example, my first instinct was to think of, oh, they're the other. But mm -hmm. now it's totally different. Now if I saw someone wearing a cross necklace, now I see that as a bridge. I could go up to them and say, oh, it looks like you believe in Jesus Christ. I do too. Tell me more about your beliefs. It's this opening. And so I see the cross not as a barrier, but as a bridge to help mm -hmm. Christians connect with each other. And, and it is interesting. You know, Recently, Elder Holland gave a really powerful talk on this subject. One of the things that he said, and, and I'm paraphrasing, it, he said something along the lines of, while we don't generally use the symbol of the cross I wish to make abundantly clear our profound respect and admiration for those who do. So I think that was an important uh, point to not put down or criticize people who, who are doing that. Um, like you said, our, our clear focus is the living Christ. Without the Savior's resurrection, we have no hope. I also thought it was interesting, and you, you may have noticed this in the UK a few months ago, um, if you would search the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on Google Maps, the symbol that would show up by the church is an angel Moroni. But a few months ago, that changed and those were replaced with crosses. Right. And I don't understand like all of the technical details behind it, but it has something to do with how Google Maps was classifying the church and the church apparently had been given a, a non-Christian classification, uh, uh, classified as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which has... A uh, Moroni symbol, and every Christian church was given a cross. And so apparently the church, and I may have the details not 100% correct, but apparently the church requested to Google Maps, no, please make our primary identification Christian and a secondary identification Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Right. That way, uh, you know, if you're a random person in Boston or London and you're searching Christian church near me, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will appear. I've always found it quite difficult in interfaith settings to properly relate to other Christian denominations, even even despite them being Protestant or Catholic. Um, there's always been a sort of gap, as you as you say, between us and and them. And I don't know. I I, I wonder why that is, because um, we we don't. I feel like we don't talk as much about being the one true church, like perhaps people in the past have focused on that. Uh, obviously, if you're belonging to a church and you're devout to that, you probably think it's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, but holding, I don't know, maybe that's changed. But yeah, what do you think a healthy relationship with the cross looks like? Uh, you know, when I, when I visit uh, Christian homes, there is a lot of artwork about the crucifixion. Uh, whereas we might focus on the resurrection more in our artwork, for example, or or hope. But apart from the sort of iconoclastic uh, symbols of it, what does a healthy relationship with the cross look like? I think, honestly, that's probably going to vary from person to person. It's probably easier to tell what a healthy relationship with the cross doesn't look like. You know, if, if I feel a huge aversion to it, um, that might not be in keeping with 
what Jesus Christ himself said. If you remember in Doctrine and Covenant section 6, he says, Look unto me in every thought, doubt not, fear not. And then the very next phrase he says is, Behold the wounds in my hands and in my feet and in my side. In other words, the resurrected Christ is urging us to fix our eyes on his crucifixion wounds. The prophet Jacob in Jacob chapter 1 verse 8 said that he wanted everyone to view Christ's death. Now, I don't think that means that everyone needs to get a gigantic picture of the crucifixion and put it in their homes, but I do think that there can be a spiritual power that can come into our lives as we spend time contemplating the death of Jesus Christ and remembering that without the crucifixion, we would not have his atonement. It's a key part of Christ's atonement. And so, again, I'm certainly not trying to dictate anyone's personal choices of artwork. I think that relationship is going to be, um, you know, vary from person to person. But recently I was talking with a student and she'd been a victim of uh, some sexual abuse. It was like a very horrible situation. And she kind of felt like nothing was helping her. And then as she started to look at crucifixion artwork and think more about Christ's crucifixion, that uh, somehow like so, maybe sometimes we want to whitewash those details because it's painful to talk about. Yeah. You know, you know, it's not pleasant to talk about the details of crucifixion. But for her, she like really dove deep and studied what Christ experienced on the cross. She started to realize he really understands my pains. He gets me. And for her, that was a very comforting image. And again, this will vary. Like my mother-in-law, I am sure will never see a picture of the crucifixion up in her house because she's a very sensitive person. She would not want to see that type of image. But for many people, Jacob's invitation to view Christ's death can be a powerful one. Mm -hmm. I, I talked about this on a recent podcast um, about Russian art and how they perceive uh, Christ compared to us and how our Christian art is... You know, Christ looks very dignified, uh, nice hair, um, very clean and neat looking and often with a halo and compared to in Russia where he's uh, very distorted, hunched over, mm. straggly hair. Um, and it is that perception again, you know, they perceived Christ during Soviet times as the example of uh, grace in suffering, whereas we sort of look at that ultimate example. Uh, I'm speaking in a general sense. Of course, you have people like that who, similar to those people, are looking to Christ in that state of vulnerability. In fact, that is, that's one of the things I've always found so profound about the image of the crucifixion is when you look at how most animals are created, their vital organs are protected. And they're, they're, they're on all fours um, and their vital organs are facing down. Uh, they're not open to view. Whereas with humans, we're made to be vulnerable because we're, we're stood like this. My, I'm facing you and all of my vital organs uh, are stood right up with me. And technically, that's vulnerable. <laughs> and so the way that Christ died was arms open, facing everything, his most, the, you know, the most vital parts of his body outstretched. I think there's something very profound in that, that perhaps you don't get from the image of Gethsemane that may inspire. But anyway, that's just my thought. Of yeah, that. <laughs> no, and, and that just goes to show the beautiful, um, beautiful reflections and insights that can come from considering the cross and what Christ experienced on Calvary. It's the event that Jesus Christ himself defined as his greatest act of love. Mm -hmm. So certainly Christ's crucifixion is something that we should study and let rest in our hearts. And if you're in BYU, you can go to the art gallery, wherever it is, and, and see the cross above it now that we've mentioned it. 